It's good to see uh, this number out. We're obviously uh, a little short tonight with the weather and uh, some people not getting out. Um, so let's uh, continue to remember everyone as they travel, especially this evening as we go home. Uh, I think most of the main roads are clear, but some of the side roads are still fun, especially if you're not used to driving. Uh, conditions like this. All right, so tonight, uh, if you're watching online, which I'm assuming that we have probably a few more watching on YouTube than what we normally do, uh, Jesse forgot his phone. So if you have questions, feel free to, to text me, 931-267-6906, uh, and we'll try to get you included um, if you do have any questions or comments, either one. So we're picking up with lesson one with uh, question number five. Let me just scroll through here to uh, number five. And go ahead and pull your Bibles out. And turn over to Genesis chapter two. Um, we kind of hit on this at the very end of class last week, and so for the sake of time, I kind of pushed us through, and we uh, didn't actually read the passage. But I do want to go ahead and and read that as we think about this question and. As we look at this passage, uh, the question is, what can we learn about the home and family uh, from this passage? So we'll start over here with Tim. Uh, if you want to take a couple of verses apiece, and then we'll work our way back. So Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 25. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. But the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. All right, so what can we learn about the home and family from this passage? Jesse, we'll let you start us off. I know we did touch on this just a little bit. Um, not enough, though, so I wanted to touch on it just a little bit more. Well, one thing we can learn, it was definitely part of God's plan from the beginning because he's the one that brought it about. Uh, you go as long as you want. <laughs> um, of course, we learn this text um, where it's repeated, of course, later in the Bible, but how a man is to leave his original home and family, leave father and mother, to begin a separate new home with his wife, and uh, how the two uh, also, of course, become one flesh, and then how there is no shame of nakedness between the husband and his wife. All right. So, do you have anything in particular that you pulled out of that? Nothing more than that. Andy? Uh -huh. No, not, not necessarily. I'm not sure what you were wanting. But... <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what I'm wanting. Actually, I create these questions uh, and I have in my mind kind of what I'm thinking, but I don't write my own answers right away. And then sometimes I'll go back and I'll look at it and I'm like, man, what was I thinking? I, sh I should have wrote down something more than... <laughs> uh, anybody else have anything? Ken? Well, I just think 
in these days and times, we can go back to this passage and clearly see that marriage is between a man and a woman. Yeah, most definitely. Um, one of the things that I did point out at the very end of the last class, uh, and Jesse hit on this, it's interesting how up until this point, with all of creation, uh, everything that God had created, it was good. And then he finally gets to this, uh, this particular situation here, and uh, Adam's uh, alone, and God says, this ain't good. Um, and we know that Adam was uh, somewhat of a skilled man already because he's able to work the garden. God gave him the garden to tend and to keep, uh, to subdue the earth. He names all of the, the animals, uh, so he's got dominion over the animals. Uh, but yet he still announces that it's not good that Adam is alone. And so uh, there's different translations as far as the word uh, that is used there for the help uh, meet, for the helper as far as Eve. But it was someone that was fit for him, someone that was going to complement him, uh, some, someone that corresponded to him is kind of the, the language that is used there. Go ahead, Norm. It, uh, from the standpoint of them, uh, similarities, they're, they're like, they're similar, but they're different. It's uh, it, because the idea was that, uh, he, I mean, he, if, if Adam just needed another set of hands, then another, he could have, God could have created a, another man and they could have lived forever and, you know, whatever it's, it, as, as it goes in, but he didn't. He, he took and, and created from the, that one, and we can see a lot of similarities between men and women, but made it so that, like you said, it was complementing that. And of course, the procreation part is going to come in, and that that is the real that is the real kicker in there, where you have big part of it. Yeah, not only the two, but then from each of the uh, from those two comes a, a completely unique but similar. You know, individuals known as children. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's the, the the union that is made there is something that we'll talk more about as we get into to lesson two. Um, and Jesse kind of hit on this this idea of leaving and cleaving and becoming one flesh. Uh, and, and so there is this union that is made. But I, I think oftentimes we dwell on the physical or maybe even the sexual union. Uh, that's that's being discussed here, and I think that that, that is very uh, evident. But when you, when you look at this and you look back at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, where uh, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. So it's not just Adam that is made in the image of God. Woman is also made in the image of God. And so I had read... Uh, something that said that these are two eternal beings that are created with God's own image, making a covenant that while it only lasts while the flesh and blood lives, has eternity in its scope and purpose since we are here to help one another reach spiritual goals. What is disappointing is when you and I as Christians have a dominantly physical view of marriage as if God brought us together so we could just have a family and not feel lonely. We're made in the image of God and this union is made uh, by God and so there's this spirituality to it as well that um, this union I think there's more to it than just the, the physical and the, um, the earthly sense that we oftentimes focus on and we'll talk about that a little bit more too with lesson two. Any other comments on number five? Go ahead Andy. I was thinking when you were talking there um, in the, the way that uh, with the, Jeremiah, I guess it's in Jeremiah, where it says that that um, God knows better than man. <laughs> Basically, that's the idea. And it, so it's very interesting that Adam has named all the animals. He's already tended the stuff, and when it came to Eve, God didn't ask Adam what he wanted him to have. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, there's a lot of wisdom in that. <laughs> that is, uh, that's for sure. I think that's Jeremiah 55, 8, and 9. Or is that Isaiah? Yes. All right, number six. What can we learn? So we just finished up studying 
uh, all through the book of Genesis. And so at some point throughout the class, we'll probably look at a lot of different uh, families within the Bible for both good examples and bad examples for uh, marriages, for parenting, uh, for different aspects of the home and family. But for this one, I just wanted you to kind of focus on uh, the book of Genesis and what can we learn from families that we've studied so far. So I just, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list, but Adam and Eve, Noah and his family, Abraham and his family, Lot and his family, Isaac and his family, Jacob and his family, and on and on and on. So, Bonnie, what'd you come up with for something you could learn from those families? Well, I have some specific things, but one of the things that stood out to me when I looked at just that list is with the exception of, I think, Adam and Eve and Lot, all of the rest of them are mentioned in Hebrews 11 for the Hall of Faith. And I thought that was kind of interesting because each one of those did something wrong at some point in time, but they also did something right. And I think that in and of itself can be a lesson for us that we're not going to do everything perfectly all the time. We're going to mess up, but we can still get back on track. It's never too late as long as we are still living and we can make it and you know, make it to the end because most of those did. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I know you hear that, you know, the formidable years of, uh, of child rearing is when they're young. And I know that there are parents that's like, okay, well, it's too late. I mean, I might as well give up. It's, it's, the damage is already done and we can't ever give up. Um, we, we have to continue to, to fight. And if we didn't do something correctly, then we need to correct it and, and try to do it better uh, in the future. Um, and I've mentioned this uh, before, and I'll mention it multiple times in this class. This is one of the things that I've taken away from my own parents, because um, I had some pretty stubborn people in my family. Uh, I know people think I'm stubborn, but there was someone more stubborn than me. And my, uh, my parents were very persistent and could have given up on any of the three of us, and they didn't, and it shows. Uh, and so we've got to, to keep, keep it on. And, Bonnie is right, there's a lot of bad that they did, uh, and yet a lot of them are still listed in the, the Hall of Faith there. Norm? Well, right from the beginning, God uh, gives us an idea that uh, life by design, God's design, is one of turmoil. We see, we see this in Job. <laughs> Job is lamenting about, you know, man's life is just a, full of chaos and turmoil. Right? Yes, by design, and it's uh, the it's by through the combination of the mistakes, the good decisions, the bad decisions that the character is is completed and developed, and we become more like we come closer to God as a result of those things. Uh, if everything was just well, you you've seen people where everything's just laid out on a plate for them, and they they come out much the worse at the end for it. Yeah. Drew, do you have anything that you've seen from the families here? Uh, one thing I thought of was weakness in either partner can lead to temptation for both in a married relationship. Um, I think about Adam and Eve, but also just from teaching Gen the last part of Genesis here, favoritism destroys families. So uh, we see that just all throughout the patriarchs. It's, yep. it's rampant. So. That's, a, uh, that's one of the, the big ones that I have down here. I mean, I do tell my kids, every day's a new day. So today might be your day, so you should always strive to be my favorite. Um, <laughs> but we see, especially with the families here in Genesis, that favoritism, it really does cause irreparable harm to the whole family. And if you, if you think about it, uh, I mean, obviously we know it begins with Isaac and Rebecca after the birth of uh, of, of Esau uh, and Jacob, and that's obviously um, just huge within and of itself and the, the problems that it causes. And then it just continues on to the next generation with even greater negative consequences. And we know the situation with Jacob and his wives and his dealings with, with Laban and favoritism uh, that's being played there. Uh, and then we've got, of course, the issue with uh, um, Jacob's favoritism toward his wives, which that's another problem. Uh, I guess the polygamy that's going on, which isn't necessarily what God had designed uh, from the beginning and the favoritism that is going on there. Um, 
but uh, obviously the, the worst of it is when you get to, to Jacob's favoritism with, with Joseph. And, I mean, it just, it's just like it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse until uh, you get to, to Joseph. And, yeah, the, uh, the issues that are brought about by favoritism are very easily seen here in the book of Genesis. Jesse? With Noah, we, we can learn that no matter how wicked or corrupt the world gets, we can still have a family that's separate from that and faithful to Definitely. That was a, a great example. Um, Any others that anybody could see right offhand? One of them that's kind of another kind of overriding theme is moral compromise uh, and how that it can produce a lot of problems just within the family. And we see that starting off with Abraham where he lies about Sarah and then Isaac does the exact same thing. And I mean, I'm sure he had to have been told, you know, some of these uh, stories that uh, had happened and so uh, you see issues there but if you think about Lot and his family and you think about the moral compromise that uh, that took place there um, I mean that's one of the saddest examples we've got and of course it says that uh, in the beginning that um, he relocated as far as Sodom even though he knew the reputation of the the city and uh, I mean you can just kind of think that what he's probably thinking in his mind that he's going to be maybe even like Noah and my family's going to be okay we're going to be able to withstand um, withstand this and he just keeps getting closer and closer and closer um, and it ends up affecting obviously his entire family uh, because of it and he had to be dragged out of the city you know by angels even after being warned of the destruction of the city and so we have to be careful uh, of that one of the, an, another one that I thought of on top of just the favoritism was, um, I mean, you, I guess you could call it family feuds, but a lot of it is sibling rivalry, which we'll talk about more whenever we talk about parenting in particular, and that, that can be a, a big issue, but you've got, obviously, Cain and Abel, uh, a big issue there. We talked about Jacob and Esau a little bit, and then all of Jacob's sons and the sibling rivalry that's going on, um, and how that can really, really affect uh, a family. Anything else from the families in Genesis? All right, turn over to Psalm 127. So these are the two passages that I've got listed on the top of the lesson sheet. And these are kind of the, the theme passages, I'll say, for, for the class. And so I thought... Well, let's uh, just consider them a little bit more and what we can learn about the Christian home and family from these passages. So Psalm 127, let's go ahead and read uh, all five verses. So Sue, we'll pick up with you and just work our way back. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sheep. Behold, brethren, are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. You know, I think all the times when we think of Psalm 127, we think of the, the last few verses there, and maybe not so much the first couple. Uh, and that's really what I wanted to, to focus on. And so, um, what, what, what can we learn from, from that? I mean, the whole, all, all of it together, but especially the first couple of verses. I'll just open it up. Norm? This is a famous line. Uh, Benjamin Franklin loved this particular. Thing, and he, he, he brought this out a lot during the Constitutional Convention because it's such a powerful uh, idea. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. And uh, yeah, I mean, that there's the world has many, many ideas on, you know, great ideas on how the family, you know, what, what, what the family should look like and marriage and all that kind of stuff. But unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Yeah. 
I didn't know that about Benjamin Franklin. That's interesting. Anything else? Submit to God's plan, his arrangement, his instructions regarding the home and the family. Then we're going to, as a blessing, we're going to have a happy, happy, strong, enduring home. If he's the one building it, we're following his, his plan, his blueprint. So uh, I know I've mentioned this before, too. Whenever I, I teach on a subject, I get like a whole bunch of books, and I just start reading a bunch of stuff. Um, and so I've got a book by Edwin Crozier. It's called Built by the Lord, and this is a study of the, the home and family. So I'm not going to do a lot of this, but what he wrote in regards to Psalm 127 and how it's going to relate to us for this entire class, uh, I thought was really, really uh, good. So I wanted to, to share that uh, with you. So I've got just a, a few snippets. Um, from the, this is actually the introduction to the book. He says, because of Psalm 127, 3 through 5, we almost universally apply this psalm to the family. However, when we examine this psalm in its historical context, we gain insight from a different angle, providing a great illustration for us. This psalm is attributed to Solomon. With that in mind, we cannot help but think of the great house about which Solomon was most concerned to build, the temple, the house of Jehovah God. Further, as king, we can't help but think uh, Solomon had a particular city in mind as he wrote this psalm, Jerusalem. To add to this picture, this psalm is in the Songs of Ascent section. This was one of the psalms the Jews sang as they traveled on their annual pilgrimages to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Lord. They sang this psalm as they prepared to worship at the house of God in the city of God. This psalm was first and foremost about the temple of God, the city of God, and the nation of God. Yet this nation was itself a family. Just as God would deal with the nation, its capital, and its house of worship, so does God deal with the individual family. With this historical context in mind, I believe we learned some fascinating lessons from the building and rebuilding of the Lord's house and city. Lessons we can apply them to our own families. So he's got five points, things that he pulls from, uh, from this that will help our family. So he says, first, if we want the Lord to build our homes, we must invite him to do so. And he lists a couple of passages where we know that David prayed uh, that Solomon would be strengthened in the building of, of the temple. We know that Solomon himself prayed uh, that God um, make all the work on the temple worthwhile. And so he makes the point that without inviting God into the temple, David's preparation and Solomon's work would have been meaningless. However, they invited God to be a part of it, and God demonstrated that he accepted their invitation in Second Chronicles chapter 7. It's pretty important with our homes and our families that we're going to invite God into it and that God is going to be the central part uh, of that. Second, uh, he says in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 19, it says, All this said David the Lord made me understand in writing by, by his hand upon me all the details of the pattern. The design of God's temple was not left up to man. Solomon was to follow God's pattern. If we want the Lord to build and guard our homes, we must follow his pattern. This is not about what feels right to us. It is not about what we want or what society has determined. This is not about cultural norms and taboos. It is about God's word and pattern. And we talked about this some um, last week with uh, uh, our very first lesson that there is a pattern set forth that God wants the family uh, structure to look like. And we know that that's not always the case. And there are going to be circumstances that are beyond our control that we uh, can't have that, but that's God's desire. And we need to, as a family structure, uh, to make sure that we're following that pattern. So thirdly, he says, we must not push Psalm 127, verse 2, farther than God intended it to go. This psalm teaches that without God's involvement, our work is vain. Further, it teaches that God blesses his servants even when they are resting. However, this psalm does not intend to teach that if we simply pray and read our Bibles, God will do everything else and we do not need to work. In fact, when we see Nehemiah rebuilding the city of God and relying on God to guard the city, we read two powerful verses. Nehemiah 2 verse 18 says, Then they said, Let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Then Nehemiah 4 verse 6 says, So we built and the wall of the whole was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. If the Lord will build our homes, we must have a mind to work, and we must put our hands to the work. And I think that's a great point because it just doesn't happen, all right? Even with the point that Bonnie made with all the mistakes that they made, and yet they're still listed in the Hall of Faith, that didn't happen without work. Uh, Jesse brought up Noah, all right? His, 
making sure that his family stayed on the straight and narrow, so to speak, that took work. And there is work that's going to be involved. Uh, yes, if you're going to be a good husband, it's going to require work. If you're going to be a good wife, it's going to require work. If you're going to be a good parent, it's going to require a lot of work. All right, so there's work that has to be done. Fourth, when the Jews returned to Jerusalem from the captivity, they almost immediately began to rebuild the house of the Lord. Their enemies discouraged them. Building stopped. I'm sure at first they were sorrowful and looked for opportunity to restart the building. However, based on Haggai 1, verses 1 through 8, it appears they became complacent. How easy is it to get uh, distracted with the mundane and material issues of everyday life under the sun? We must not allow these things to distract us from God's things. As Colossians 3, verse 2 says, we must set our mind on things above and not on things of the earth. And how easy is that to happen, too, especially when the work gets hard. <laughs> Uh, it's easy to let other things kind of take over uh, and other cares of the world take over. And we have to remember the importance of uh, making sure that we're putting the work in with our home and family. And then fifth, as, an, as important as the house and the city of God were, we have to ask, why did God abandon them? Not once, but twice. If the Lord built the house and the Lord guarded the city, nothing should have happened to them. Why then is the temple in ruins and the city a war zone? Despite all the good examples set by God's people, providing the basis for our first four points, God's people stopped serving Him. If we want the Lord to build and guard our home, we must always serve the Lord. We must not bank on past service and submission. We have not obligated God to us through our past work. If we abandon God, He will eventually abandon us. And so this is something that we're going to have to to continue uh, with, we're going to have to keep keeping on. We're going to have to endure until the end. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. So let's make sure that God is going to be the central part of our homes and our family. Anything else on Psalm 127? All right, go ahead and turn over to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24. Marissa, if you would read 3 and 4 for us. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is full of strength, and... Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, you got it. All right, so what about the... Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. What can we learn from that? I'll just open it up. Knowledge and wisdom comes from God, and Proverbs just emphasizes that kind of throughout the book, but um, as well as other scriptures, obviously, to emphasize that. And so when we're talking about our subject, marriage and family, if, if we want to, again, to have the kind of marriages and homes and parenting that God desires, then we need to obtain the knowledge and wisdom that he blesses us with through his his word and how wonderful that'll be when that's the case. Anybody else? Norm? Well, just the, uh, when you look at wisdom, understanding, and knowledge there, uh, uh, wisdom, of course, is the, the God's plan in there, but the, the establishment of something, when you, the, the, under, the understanding, I mean, establishment in this particular case is the longevity of of that house that was built. And uh, it's so critical for you to be able to pass on the legacy of that which started you off. The, the, the founding father's kind of a, of a situation there where you can pass that on from uh, place to place. And, uh, and then the, that beautiful picture of, uh, and it's through knowledge the rooms are filled. Uh, you know, like, back to your point, that's work. That's uh, and it's with each generation that those rooms either become filled or emptied. Yeah. And and so you know what does each generation bring to that house that that now that continues to to keep it established as it goes on? Yeah. Person. 
Just that there are three kinds of knowledge. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge are all different. So wisdom, usually you get over time. Understanding, you have to be willing to work toward. And knowledge is uh, more straightforward than the other two. Yeah, and I think it's interesting how with those you have uh, it being built, it being established, and then it being filled. So it's almost like this. there's a progression with that uh, as well. And I'm really not going to do this a lot, but I did find something in Robert Harkrider's book that spoke specifically to this. And, man, some people can work stuff a whole lot better than I can word it, okay? So uh, I just want to share uh, just a few words on what he has to say um, on Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. So he says, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. These three words are used interchangeably in Proverbs, yet they are not exactly the same. These verses are not t talking about things such as a new house, furniture, decorations. Marriages are not made strong because of what we have or possess, but by what we are. Notice the three verbs, built. The Hebrew word used means to restore, to refurbish, to attain a successful and flourishing condition. Some marriages need to be remodeled like we do houses, established. This word means to set in order something that is cluttered, to stand upright something fallen, to correct the path that was once wrong. Filled, the idea expressed is more than just filling a glass of water, but that of overflowing, Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. When a home is properly built, set in order, you can find fulfillment in every room, even in the private areas of your household where no one is looking but you. It will be filled with precious and pleasant riches. And then he asked the question, what is your home like? When you return to your house, if you find it burned to the ground, those riches of Proverbs 24, 3, and 4 will not be destroyed. Many have become mesmerized, paralyzed into thinking we need more things, when in fact our rooms remain empty because what we need is more wisdom, more understanding, and more knowledge. So, again, I thought that was uh, pretty good as far as getting us uh, kind of a foundation of building our homes and our families and our marriages. And so we need to have God as the central part of it, but we need to make sure that we're striving for that, that wisdom, that understanding, and that knowledge. Anything else from Lesson 1? Any other comments? All right. So, Lesson 2, God's design for marriage. And again, uh, so this was on your question sheet with lesson one, and just want to make mention of it again as we go throughout the class. Um, if there are questions that either you have or questions that you think would be of benefit uh, to someone else, uh, please uh, shoot those to me, and I'll make sure to get them added in um, to whatever lesson is going to be uh, the best. All right, so... Uh, Psalm 127, again, verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Uh, Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. All right, question number one. After reading Genesis 2, 24, answer the following question. So we'll just take them one at a time. What does it mean to leave in the context of marriage? And I put in there that you can, uh, can, can consider Mark 7, 10 through 13, and 1 Timothy 5, in verse 4. So we just read that at the beginning of class, Genesis 2 in verse 24, this idea of leaving and cleaving. So what does it mean here to leave within the context of, of marriage? Ken? <clears throat> well, I just said it. It means you're no longer a member of your parents' household, but you are now starting your own family. And I also added, even if you are, live in the same house, you have new priorities and responsibilities. Okay. All right. And his workbook on the families states it pretty strongly. He said the term means to forsake completely, to abandon, underscores the need for children to renounce totally the rule of their parents over their households. And that, I think he said one, was one lawyer had told him that the number one problem he deals with is yeah, yeah, he did mention that. I mean, of course, I've always heard the biggest three problems with marriages are money, sex, and in-laws. Uh, those are the things that I've heard at least uh, over the years. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the in-laws would be a big one. 
I was thinking when I read that that it wasn't actually him that said that, but was that Walter Trobish that said that, but I may be mistaken. Um, but yeah, he says it pretty strongly. So there is this idea of, um, or I guess one of the reasons why I included Mark 7, 10 through 13, and, and 1 Timothy 5 and verse 4 is, what, what does that tell us leaving is not? Yeah, we obviously have to continue to honor our father and mother. They are our parents. Um, and I think that this, uh, these passages also tell us that doesn't mean that you abandon them, all right, because there's always going to be a responsibility. Now, what you hope um, is that at least whenever you're, you're newly married, unless you don't get married to a lot older um, in years, that you're not going to have that so much of a responsibility with caring for your parents, but obviously that is going to come in play, come into play in the latter years of your marriage, and we'll talk about that towards the end of class. And so it doesn't mean that you you seriously abandon your mom and dad, and it's like, okay, I'm done with you. I have no other responsibility to, no responsibility to you. I've got my spouse now, and that's it. All right, that's not what it's talking about. Um, it, there is this sense, though, like what Ken said, of you are uh, developing a new family. And so it's not that you're no longer their child, but now your primary role, uh, if you are the father or the husband, is that you are now the head of a new household. And so that's, that's your family that you need to be most focused on. Um, and it's not dealing with, okay, every time something happens, I gotta go back and talk to my mom and dad, well, what do I need to do about this situation? That's not how you work through uh, situations when you're a newlywed, all right? So there does have to be a, a sort of separation uh, where you are now uh, with, your, with your wife or with your uh, husband. And I think that that also doesn't mean that, okay, I'm going to, to not ever listen to what they have to say. I'm not going to ask their opinion on anything. I'm not going to get their advice on anything. Okay, that's dumb, all right? When you're a newlywed, especially if you're young, you're young and dumb, so it's perfectly fine to get uh, advice and to ask questions, uh, but that's something that you need to have discussed with your, your spouse before, because if you're going around behind somebody's back and trying to get some input from your mom and dad, so then you can take it back to then use it against your husband or your wife, okay, that's bad, and that's dumb, all right? But we still do need our parents, but there is this sense um, of having our own uh, family, and so we... Uh, we leave our family in, in that sense. Other, que or other comments on leaving? All right. What does it mean to cleave? We use that term a lot, don't we? Tim, what do you think it means to cleave? Well, uh, I put down that in the New King James Version, it uh, renders that word, it says to be joined to. To be joined to. All right, what do you think about that when we have things that are joined? Glue, yeah. That's one of the, the definitions that if you look at the, the term, it, it actually means to adhere or glue together, to stick together, uh, to hold fast. Um, other comments on cleaving? Ken? Interesting that the word, we think of a meat cleaver. Yeah. <laughs> it divides the meat. We're I talking about putting it together. I didn't think about it. that, but I wasn't going to bring it up. But. <laughs> You know, a kid like hanging on to you. You know, you're like, like we were talking about joins. You're you're bonded together. When you're cleaving, you're you're making sure you're holding fast to each other. Um, so that's what I think of when I hear the word cleave. Obviously, join kind of creates that glue, that bond, and cleave is like a choice to to stay. You know, holding each other. I think of it like clinging. Yeah. Bye. Oh, I just thought it was kind of funny. When I first looked it up um, in a concordance dictionary thing, I forget which one it was, um, but it said to adhere firmly or split. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, those are two different things. Um, but like Ken was saying, like a meat cleaver, um, like there's different variations. So it's, it's weird, like the English word, there's some kind of deviation, I guess, somewhere down the line, I don't know. But Strong's, um, definitely gives that that um, definition of cling and here like tim said be joined together 
So yeah. God, God used the right word. Yeah. He knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Uh, so Drew, go ahead. Where so, there's actually a whole um, like set of words. It's called a contronym when a word means uh, the opposite, depending on its usage. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> a contronym. So like a contradiction. So uh, on this particular word, Barnes actually knows he says in chapter with his wife. The word cleave denotes a union of the firmest kind. It is the original taken from gluing and means so firmly to adhere together that nothing can separate them. And then uh, Harkrider notes, he says, the original meaning of cleave is to cling, to keep close, like constantly glued. Some couples enter marriage as though terminable, like buying an automobile that can be traded once we want a new one. Divorce should never be contemplated nor threatened. And when you think about divorce and how God hates divorce, and that's because we're supposed to be cleaved together. I don't think that's an actual word, but we're supposed to leave and to cleave. All right, we'll get into one flesh uh, next week. I did not see Andy's hand. Go ahead, Andy. You can finish this out. Um, whenever we finish the rest of that question next week, we'll see that they, we say that the Bible is the, is the best commentary. And so as that verse progresses along it's always building on the fact that so from the beginning of the marriage then you're you're, you're leaving you're leaving the parents behind you're bringing your union together you're making that union tight and it's going to soon become one it's going to be an actual union yep all right thanks everybody